and welcome back to our special GDEX episode. Uh, we're in the behind the show floor. This is a little to the side. Uh, I'm Mike. AJ's a nice cameraman, I call him again, even though he's a recording recorder. Uh, I have another guest with me. Could you tell me your name and what game you're working on? Yes, my name is Doug Trine, and I'm making a visual novel called Romance of Rostia. Romance of Rostia. So I got to play the game for a little bit first. Um... You really like Fire Emblem, I'm going to take it, just the Yeah, style. yeah, very, yeah, big, uh, big influence from the general kind of uh, Japanese games, a lot of uh, JRPGs, a lot of visual novel strategy games, that's definitely uh, me and my partner's wheelhouse for sure. So, the, the first thing I have a question is, so, visual novel, like, is this weird genre that, like, we all have time we tend doesn't exist, but it's surprisingly big in the industry, like, it's very, like, people who like them really like them. Mm-hmm. How would you get into that and want to make something like that? So, uh, you know, visual novels are very narrative-focused. So a lot of people who really love uh, reading uh, books or very story-heavy games like old-school JRPGs. I was someone who was raised on a lot of the PS1 classic JRPGs, a lot of the uh, old-school Final Fantasy, Suikoden's, things of that nature. And I feel like there's a, there's definitely an audience of people who enjoy those narrative-based games and uh, you know don't mind just so much text. And so a big reason why we decided to make a visual novel was because we were some we me and my partner are both people who are uh, very story-driven. We love narratives and games. Uh, you know, love kind of the anime anime aesthetic and art style and because we weren't people who really knew how to program all very well and were mainly focused on telling a good story we thought it was the perfect medium for us to uh, to, to develop one because it was mainly writing uh, heavy and art heavy and both of those uh, things we could either get from ourselves or from other people and we didn't have to spend a lot of time trying to you know figure out how to program something take a lot of crash courses and just kind of make smaller kind of uh, games based around that. We want to tell a really engaging story without us having to program a lot, essentially. So what is this built in, then, if it's, is it, if it's not as programming heavy? Uh, th- this is in an open source uh, visual novel engine called RemPy. I was uh, going to ask about mm-hmm. like Yeah, and uh, th- what's great about RemPy, it's got a very robust community online, and so the three artists that we have for our game who are doing the sprite work, backgrounds, and the CGs, we all actually found through the official RemPy forum. Uh, just posted, hey, we have paid work, here's our budget, send your portfolios in, and we found just three incredible artists that way. So what's also cool is, like, the visual novel scene has a lot of fans, a lot of people who are really into them, but there's also a very strong creator uh, sphere within that as well. And the uh, official RemPy forums are an extremely robust place for creators and fans to interact, and, like, that's the best part about that engine is that it's been around for a long time, super stable, based in Python, and so even if you don't code, they have a simplified language, but if you do know how to code in Python, you can actually break it open a little bit more and do some wilder stuff and actually make a more traditional uh, adventure game or RPG within it, too. So that's very interesting. So maybe let's jump into the actual game a bit more. So what is the elevator pitch you have for this specific Sure, okay, so uh, Romance of Raskia is a historical fantasy tale uh, that takes place in an uh, ancient Roman-esque civilization. You play as a lieutenant named Valerius who is dispatched along with his legion to quell a civil uprising in a recently conquered town. Uh, so him and his army are about ready to lay siege to this castle town, but unbeknownst to everyone else, Valerius actually has a secret love relationship with a noblewoman named Clodia in that castle. And so while his army is sieging it, he's trying to send secret letters to her back and forth to try to ensure her safety and get her out. So it's a bit of a love story, a little bit of action there. Uh, and it's a, cho- it's a choose your own adventure as well where you can make choices. So, you know, you might make the choices where she gets out alive or you don't, or maybe you die in the process, but she gets it safely. Or you might even find another girl who isn't even this noble girl and escape with her instead. And so it's about a four to five hour long game. And then with all the routes, it'll probably take about eight to ten hours to complete. How long have you guys worked? On this I would say about three, maybe four years. One year was in pre uh, was pre production, but in terms of actual development time, it's been about three years. And along a lot of that was just writing the script, finding our artists, setting kind of an artist timetable and stuff. And we're hoping to have the game out by the end of this year or early next year. And is so is it uh, looking Steam? I assume. Yeah, yeah. Platforms? So right now our demo is hosted on Itch. If you search Romance Araskia, you'd be able to find it there. Um, but we're also looking to uh, release it on uh, Steam and other digital distribution platforms. Uh, I know some people are talking to us about Discord or maybe some other uh, particular avenues. So we're going to kind of explore a decent amount, but it's going to be Mac and PC to start. And then once the base game is out, we're going to look into possibly getting a mobile version out for uh, Apple and uh, Android. I guess because I always thought those games work really well on like, some like, iPad. Yeah, that's Phone's exactly what it is. a little harder, yeah. but like, iPad, it's a big enough screen. You, could, you have the grip there. Yeah, it's, and that's what's nice about RemPy, too, 
news that's very easy to publish into all those different platforms, whether you're PC, Mac, or even like Android and uh, 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 Apple builds as well. It's, you know, basically you click a button in the menu and it does it for you. So it's, I think that's why the, uh, the community there is very strong because the engine really does a lot of the hard work for you. It just allows you to just focus on what you want to create, you know, your story primarily. Nice. And I got to say before we go to, one other thing I really got caught with you guys on, because I was playing the demo for about like five-ish minutes there too, the, the audio is really nice too, especially like there's a moment where like you're in the middle of like a battlefield and like all the javelins coming in too, like you really feel like you're there. I feel like the animation also that I was playing to go with it to mm-hmm. make it like, even though it's very much mostly static or very moving images, like it's very much felt legitimate like you're in a firefight. Yeah, we really lucked out with our sound library as well. We found a, uh, a good sound library that had a lot of uh, uh, um, set battlefield sounds of bolts being uh, let loose on giant ballistas or javelins being thrown, swords clashing, all that sort of stuff. So, And then the guy who's doing the soundtrack for us is a guy named Zach Ponser, who's a part of the Columbus band Zoo Trippin'. So he's been helping us out and making uh, music and stuff as well. So it's been nice to have an actual music mind uh, help us craft the audio, both sound effects and music for the game. Nice. Well, again, thanks thanks for your time. Today. No, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, finding the time to talk, guys. I hope everyone has a great GDC. Or not GDC, GX. <laughs> That's the other big one. Good. Yeah. <laughs> this is when we all are tired. It's only a day. Yeah, yeah, already. Yeah. Imagine a day from now it's yeah. going to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have, have a good GDX, everyone. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike. Here with me, we have AJ holding the microphone. It's fine. We're just going to pretend he's not with us today. Uh, we're here in the middle of the GDX show floor. We're behind the GDX show floor, I guess. And uh, we have with me our first interview. Could you tell me the game you're working on? Who are you? Where you're from? All that fun stuff. Hi, yeah. Uh, so my name's Andrew Schwartz. Uh, I'm a designer and director on Fault and Fragment, uh, and we're based out of Washington, D.C. So you you came a nice journey <laughs> from here. Yeah, it was a little bit of a drive, for sure. So is this like your first time you're showing off the game? You showed off a lot. Uh, we've done a few conventions. We started doing conventions this year. So we started with MAGFest uh, in January. We did a couple local conventions around the D.C. area and the Maryland area. Um, GDEX is the first one that we've had to travel like a, a fair amount to do, though. So when you're doing these conventions, are you doing it like for like play testing? Or are you doing it just to get people like as marketing? What are you looking at this stuff as? Uh, we do a little bit of play testing and feedback. Uh, marketing is a, of course, obviously a pretty important thing. We actually just put out, uh, we just launched uh, our Steam wish list page. Um, so, you know, getting the word out at conventions is a really nice thing to do. We've done conventions for pitches as well. Okay. Um, you know, that sort of thing. So, so it's a lot of, it's a little bit of just doing as much as humanly possible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, conventions are just a really good opportunity to do, yeah, basically everything you get to do, uh, everything you need to do if, as far as game dev is concerned that's not just actually working on the game. But you're telling me there's more to a game than just building it in my basement and going, here it is, world. <laughs> you do <laughs> actually have to, like, talk to people. Yes, it's difficult. <laughs> so let's go back onto the game then. So could you want to give, like, your elevator pitch the game so I don't botch it? Sure, sure, sure. So we call Fault and Fragment a funeral Metroidvania. Um, it's a 2D top-down action RPG. Uh, it's got very, like, Metroidvania kind of level design. That's where that comes in. Uh, the game thematically is all about sort of taking a dying world and, like, putting it to rest. So you do a lot of interacting with, like, the ghosts of, like, uh, civilizations long past. And, uh, yeah, sort of interacting with, like, a very post-apocalyptic medieval world and uh, sort of figuring out what it's all about. So let's see if I got that right. So you said it was so it's a Metroidvania, but it's a 2D uh, top-down yeah. action adventure? Yeah, so we call it Metroidvania uh, specifically in terms of how Metroidvanias are designed, like level design-wise. And then I assume you go back uh, to an area. Yeah, a lot of recursiveness. Gaining. Yeah, a lot of kind of going back um, and sort of incrementally moving forward um, as you develop, like as you get new abilities, basically. Um, so that's sort of where we're looking at it from the Metroidvania angle. I mean... Theoretically, like, there's no, like, 2D side-scrolling platforming. Right. Uh, but, you know, other than that, like, Metroidvania is really, as far as I see them, it's just a reward schedule and a level design. Like so it's kind of so. like how, like, Batman we get to in, in uh, Metroidvania, even though it's n- nothing like any of those games. Yeah, example, exactly. Because you go back to that same section. Yeah. So I'm curious then, so, like, how do you find... So you already mentioned a very thing that, like, when you pitch to people, it has to be very fun to be like, it's this, 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 and this. Yes. So how are you finding it, like, sitting with people, like, in the more, like, maybe mainstream sense, that sense kind of, who are not super, super, super into everything? Sure. Um, What I like to do is talk as little as possible when you're talking to kind of the public. Mm -hmm. Um, Just let people 
kind of play the game, watch them. If they have questions, answer them. If they want you to talk about the game, you know, then you can kind of run through your, like, oh, here's my elevator pitch, here's what it's all about. But with people just playing the game, you know, conventions are a really great opportunity to just get people's cold reads. And I think you really don't want to miss out on that, right? Mm. You just want to let people, like, play the game. Don't talk to them about it, because once you launch, right, you're not going to be hovering over people's, everybody's shoulders who picks up your game. Your game needs to be, your game needs to communicate everything it needs to communicate to someone without you standing there. Nice. Uh, you don't ask the fun question. Do you have a release date in mind for this game? Was it when it comes out? We're shooting for either late 2020, or early 2021. Okay. Uh, like I said, we're on Steam Greenlight right now. Um, Is that your target? Or not Greenlight, platform? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So we're Steam Wishlist, not Greenlight. My bad. It's early. Um, <laughs> we are targeting Steam. Uh, after that, we're going to look. We're looking into uh, Switch porting and then PS4 porting. Okay. Are you so you're just looking Steam? No, no itch, no early access, or are you thinking early access? In Steam? Um, we might do early access. <laughs> uh, it's really a question of like, does early access work for a single player narrative driven experience? Yeah, those are always the best questions. <laughs> yeah, and I, we're kind of our thoughts on that right now are not really, mm -hmm. um, but we might do early access. We might not. It just depends on... <laughs> Got it. Okay. Not doing early access. <laughs> when in doubt, look in the crowd and they go, no, you yeah, just walk exactly. right by. I didn't think of that. Exactly. Uh, cameraman, do you have any questions for him? What with him on the way? I do not. Okay, perfect. Well, well again, thanks for the fun talk. Cool. We're probably going to go play this game now, and we'll catch you all you guys next time. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Hello everyone, this is another special interview from the GDAX floor. This is AJ. I'm here with Jeremy from... Okay, is it Handelabra? It is! Okay. You nailed it in one. We have so okay. many people who, who have such a hard time with that, but yeah, it's like Candelabra, but with an H. Yep. Yeah. That's kind of, I was like, looks close enough. So, so and you've got Aeon's Edge that just came out. Yeah, so the, the game's called Aeon's End. It's a deck-building game. And actually, so what we do is we work with companies that actually make physical tabletop games, and we yeah. help them turn them into digital games. So okay. it's, a, it's a real game. You can go out and you can buy it and you can play it on the tabletop. But That's if you don't have time to set it up, you can play it now on Steam and you can play it on your tablet. Um, it's a deck building game, uh, but it's a little bit of a twist where you never shuffle your deck. So okay. the order you discard in, you're actually setting yourself up for future turns. So it's okay. a little bit more strategic in that way. But where randomness comes in in this game is that the order of the turns is random every round. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's got a couple of those innovations. So it plays a little bit differently than a lot of other deck builders. Uh, but, you know, the theme is basically you are these mages in the far-flung future. These monsters come through the breaches. They destroy most of humanity, and it's just your job to protect the last human city of Gravehold. Uh, and you can play uh, one to four players. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's been out for just under a month at this point, uh, and it just came out on tablets last week. Okay. Uh, and people seem to be enjoying it. Yeah, and that's the one you've got here that's what i played yeah that okay. is the one that's here at, I, at I will GDX. say i may have skipped over the fact that how you discard is how you pull ah i was just discarding yeah well and, and if you were playing through the tutorial they don't actually okay. teach that until like a, a couple turns in okay. because it, at the beginning of the game you have nothing but you know sort of basic cards basic in your deck so, so the order is going to be very unlikely to matter okay. it's as you start buying up things like so for instance one of the cards in the game is called diamond cluster which is will gain you two ether when you play it but if you play two of them together, you gain an additional two ether. So it's either two by itself, or if you get two of them, it's six. Yeah. You want those all together at right. all the same time if you can. And so, you know, if you have two in your hand, you want to discard them right at the same time so that they end up in your next hand together. Um, and one of the other things is you can actually always pull up both your deck and your, and your discard to see what, you know, what your subsequent hands are going to be if you need help sort of figuring out how the order to discard. It's always, all that information is always at your fingertips. Yeah, it seems to be really cool. I mean, I was having fun. It was definitely the, you know, the, that classic of playing something to then attack. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of other games out there like that. Mm -hmm. I can think of at least a couple of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, um, deck building is a tried and true mechanic at this point. So it's really, you know, what drew us to this product was specifically the fact that it does try to take some of those sort of standard deck building things and like turn them on their head, but not in like, it's not a completely different game type. It's still right. a deck builder. You yeah. still get it, but it, it's just a little bit different than what you might be used to. For so. sure. Yeah, and it's a ton of fun, man. It's, It'll be, hopefully, it's doing well for them and for you guys. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been selling. You know, it's actually been in early access on Steam since May or June. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, 
people are buying it, people are playing it. Um, we Now our next decision, we actually have some expansion content coming, because when we kickstarted last year, there were a couple of uh, stretch goals that we reached. So that content is still coming in the next like month or so. Uh, but then after that, you know, the, the tabletop game actually already has a ton of expansion, so it'll just be a question of if we can, um, if it's selling well enough to justify making some of those expansions, because there's so much great content out there. And this is one of those games that the more options you have, the better the, the overall game becomes. So. And it's nice that there's already a product out there. Like, yeah. So it's not like, oh, all of a sudden we're kind of stuck with we got to create. No, you just look and see. Yep. You pull from what they already have and expansions that they like and ones that are doing well for them. And exactly. It's, yeah, it's, it's a cool idea. I like the idea of the company, too, of turning physical into... Thanks, yeah. You know, we... I, Part of this was because I started to realize I liked playing tabletop games, but I'm a, at the time I was a father with three kids under ten, yeah. and I just the odds of me getting out to a tabletop gaming right. night were so slim. So, low, yeah. so I was like, well, if I could just play these games on my computer or my tablet or whatever, that would be so much easier for me. And so that was some of the impetus behind when we made Sentinels of the Multiverse. And um, you know, I, I use it as a way to play the games because I couldn't get to the tabletop. You know, I'm slowly growing my own gaming group because my kids will be all old enough to play with me soon. But it, you know. I wanted to be able to play these games, and, you know, doing it digital like this, number one, it lets me play the games. Number two, it's a lot easier to market the games than something that is brand new from the ground up, because right. a lot of these are, you know, people have already maybe heard of the board game, and or, you know, we actually get a lot of people who play the video game and say, oh, I didn't even realize this was a board game, and then they go buy the board game and they take it to their next family game night. So, you know, it's... We, we love being sort of adjacent to the world of tabletop. It really is a fun space to be in. You know, we go to Gen Con every year. We're going to be at PAX Unplugged next month. Um, and it's just, you know, by and large, tabletop people are great people to hang out with. So, And then you have a new project that's on Indiegogo right now. It is. That's right. It's called Spirit Island. It's our fifth digital tabletop game. Um, it is a strategic area control game where um, you're basically playing as the spirits of the island, working with the native islanders to repel a bunch of colonists that are trying to take over your island. The way that we sort of like to describe it is, if you've ever played Settlers of Catan, it's like that, but instead of playing as the colonists, you're playing as the island. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really fun. It came out of Gen Con two years ago. Um, it's selling really, really well, and people are really, really enjoying it. And so we're super excited to be partnered with Greater Than Games again now to be um, working on another game with them. Um, and people can find it at Sentinels, uh, excuse me, at spiritislanddigital.com. I'm so used to saying sentinelsdigital.com because that's our first game. But. Cool, yeah. We'll uh, send everybody to check it out. And Thank you. That's check awesome. out uh, Aeon's End. And yeah, it's been uh, good talking to you. And hope you have a good GX. Yeah, you too. Thanks for talking to me.